Okay, so I think we're ready to start. Um, welcome everyone to this session on WASH and neglected tropical diseases. Uh, my name is Sophie Boisson. I work at the World Health Organization. Um, this session aims to review the evidence on WASH and neglected tropical diseases, um, including uh, gaps, as well as uh, challenges in generating robust evidence. Uh, we'll be discussing example of research, um, 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 looking at um, looking at you know how, how what kind of research are needed to better inform WASH and TD programming. Um, but before we start, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Sultani uh, Matende Chero to give opening remarks. Dr. Sultani is the head of the Division of Vector Bone and Neglected Tropical Diseases at the Ministry of Health in Kenya. Dr. Sultani, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sophie. And uh, it's indeed a big, a great pleasure for me to join you uh, in this uh, conference. So for the next five minutes, I'll just talk about uh, uh, WASH uh, generally in relation to uh, the neglected tropical diseases agenda. And uh, I would just want to very quickly uh, go straight into, into it. And uh, from the NTD programs uh, globally, our main goal or objective is to achieve elimination uh, of uh, these uh, neglected tropical diseases or where it is not feasible uh, at least to control these uh, diseases. Now, water, uh, the availability of safe water, sanitation and hygiene uh, in itself is an, in, a very important intervention uh, that uh, enables us to be able to achieve uh, these uh, objectives. But uh, you'll find that for most of the NTDs, we tend to use mass drug administration so that we target whole communities where the disease is endemic. And then we now uh, use mass treatment to bring down uh, the prevalence of the disease. But once we have achieved a level where we believe that uh, we have brought the disease under control, it is extremely important that we have enough uh, coverage for water, uh, sanitation, and hygiene. So WASH interventions come in as an important sustainability tool to ensure that we maintain the gains we have made uh, due to the mass drug administration. Now, uh, we know that uh, WASH is an integral factor, you know, when it comes to control and elimination of NTDs, but we do not have sufficient information as to how, sufficient evidence as to how much uh, these, uh, you know, uh, th these interventions are useful. And that is why we really need to come up with robust, uh, you know, data. Uh, we come up with, uh, you know, research uh, activities that will tell us uh, give us, uh, you know, clear information around how much wash, uh, the importance of wash in uh, control uh, activities. And I say this because uh, just the other day, uh, we were having a lecture from one of our renowned CEOs in Kenya. And he told us that if we were to provide safe water, 70% of the diseases, would, the disease problem in Kenya would, have, would be gone. Now, I remember the, one of our chairmen of the trachoma technical advisory group who actually uh, told us that trachoma is incompatible with the clean faces. So if we had water and we were able to implement uh, wash interventions in trachoma areas, it means that 100% of, uh, of the problem uh, would be gone. Now, uh, maybe just to wrap up, I'd like to just say that uh, as a country, we are taking WASH interventions very seriously. Last year, we actually um, launched our breaking transmission strategy. And one of the three main pillars is WASH interventions. Apart from mass drug administration and behavior change communication, we are looking at WASH as a major pillar in enabling us to achieve uh, elimination. But then we also have other approaches that we are looking at, other factors that we are highlighting. And one of them is research. And as a country program, just to show the importance of research, we actually have annual meetings uh, in Kenya, NTD research meetings. 
And last year, we actually hosted the first African NTD research symposium in Nairobi, just to try and make sure that we have conversations around the importance of evidence uh, towards NTD control. Now, it is my hope that even as we meet and discuss about WASH, we will be looking at how to, uh, to generate evidence about WASH and NTDs that can help programs to move faster towards the elimination goal. And with those uh, remarks, I would like to thank everyone once again uh, for giving me this opportunity and to take it back to Sophie. Thank you very much, Sophie. Thank you very much, uh, Sultani, for this great introduction into our session. Um, so I will hand over to, to Yael Velleman, who will uh, take us through a short exercise. So Yael, over to you. Thank you very much, Sophie, and thank you to Sultani for those wonderful remarks. So uh, my job is to get us all warmed up. We've all been um, sitting at home uh, quite a lot in the last few weeks, uh, so this should just get us going. Um, just one reminder before we start that um, as with other sessions in this conference, the Zoom chat is disabled uh, and we'll be using the chat function on the Pathable platform. So please keep your eye on that um, for uh, any messages and also if you need to say anything or raise any questions. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to ask you to do um, is to log on to the first of two virtual platforms that we'll be using today um, to interact with you. Um, so please all go to um, polev.com. I think Helen is also putting uh, that into the Pathable chat. Um, you can do that on your phone or on your screen now. Uh, and then enter the username WASHNTD, one word, and uh, wait for me to um, ask you a couple of questions. Then you'll be able to, um, to respond to the questions. So I'm just going to give you a second to do that. Holev.com and then enter WASH NTD. Great, so I'm hoping um, that's been done. Okay, so um, we're gonna have a very rapid quiz just to get us going. So the first question, um, they're all going to be true or false questions. So the first question is, is this statement true or false? 26% of schools in Sub-Saharan Africa had a basic hygiene service in 2019. I'm hoping you will have all joined Rick and Tom's session yesterday. And here we are. Okay. Brilliant. And I think looking at that, most of you are correct. That is the um, correct figure for schools. So obviously quite a, a difficult situation um, dealt with in most sub-Saharan African schools. Right, I'm going to move on to the next question now. Is this statement true or false? Universal access to toilets will eliminate soil transmitted helminths. So hookworm, ascaris, and trichuris. Is that true or false? Now let's see what everyone says. Okay. Right, so I can see that uh, most of you have got it right. So this is a bit of a trick question uh, because universal access to sanitation or safely managed sanitation systems uh, will probably help eliminate STH. But as most of you will know, um, access to toilets is only the first step in the chain um, of safely managed sanitation services. All right. I'm going to move on to the next question. Again, true or false, according to the BEST framework, 
all of the 20 neglected tropical diseases are WASH related. Is that true or false? And just for those of you who are not familiar with the BEST framework, it stands for behavior, environment, social inclusion, and treatment. Let's see what everyone says. Oh, a bit closer this time. Right. Okay, and the answer is true. So again, we've got uh, a lot of very clever people here. Um, so whilst not all 20 NTDs are transmitted through a WASH related pathway, we do um, acknowledge that they're all linked in some way to WASH um, some of them through the treatment that's necessary and some of them for the, the prevention um, access, um, aspect and some of them in terms of um, inclusion uh, in uh, WASH related services and reduction of stigma based exclusion. Okay, now for more controversial questions. Is this true or false? The neglected tropical disease sector does not have a role to play in wash resource allocation. What do we think about that? Is it only up to the wash sector or does the entity sector have a role to play? Okay, well, I'm really delighted to see that we're all in agreement that the NTD sector, well, some of us, 5% disagree. Oh, 13, goodness, I spoke too quickly. Um, the NTD sector probably does have a role to play in wash resource allocation simply by helping to demonstrate where the burden of disease lies, where the need is. Um, especially since people who are affected by, by NTDs are also most likely to be excluded from safe uh, water and sanitation services. And then finally, is this true or false? There is no clear evidence that improvement in WASH reduces neglected tropical disease. No evidence or no clear evidence. What does everyone say? Okay. Well, most of you seem to think that at least there is some evidence, I think, um, but I'm not going to answer this question. And instead, I'm going to pass over to Sophie to tell us more about exactly that point. Um, before I do that, however, um, I just want to get you prepped and ready for the next activity that we're going to be um, undertaking. Uh, we're going to use something called Mural. I hope that some of you will have used this before. It's like a giant whiteboard. And uh, Helen, I think, is going to paste the link to Mural in the Pathable chat. So I do recommend you do that now um, and sign in. Um, you just need to put your name in. Um, you don't need to have an account. It'll probably give you a funny animal name as well. So don't be alarmed by that or offended. Um, and then when we use the mural um, after the first couple of presentations, um, very quick tips on how to use that. If you double click on the board, you, it will generate a sticky note um, that you can type into or you can simply take the notes that are already there and drag them onto the screen as per the instructions that we will give you during the session. Um, and this is quite a huge uh, screen, but you'll be able to zoom in and out by using your mouse roller or um, using your fingers or on your screen if you have a touch screen. Um, so do click on mural and get ready. And for now, I will pass back to Sophie Boisson. Over to you, Sophie. Thanks, Yael. Um, so uh, for the next five minutes, uh, I'd like to uh, quickly reflect on the progress made on WASH and NTD collaboration, but also talk about uh, looking ahead and what's coming next. Next slide, please. So as you recall, back in 2015, WHO launched a global strategy to uh, encourage greater collaboration between 
the WASH and the NTD communities. Um, obviously, on the basis that uh, population who have the least access to WASH services are those that uh, often suffer the most from um, diseases uh, like NTDs. Um, the strategy was uh, built around four main objectives. Um, uh, the first, raising awareness, uh, using NTD data to um, inform targeting of WASH services, uh, strengthening the evidence, uh, and supporting joint planning, delivery, and monitoring of interventions. So what's been done over the past five years? Um, so we've definitely seen some growing momentum um, on, for collaboration, uh, including at uh, international, regional, but also at national level with a dedicated working group uh, being set up in several countries. Um, in 2019, a toolkit was developed jointly by WHO and the NNN the NTD NGO network. Um, this toolkit included more than 20 tools and resources, um, but really designed to provide some practical guidance on how to implement the strategy, how to collaborate on the ground. So since then, um, the, the, the toolkit uh, has, been, uh, has been used in more than 15 countries uh, to various degrees. Some countries have used it more for situation analysis that look at both disease data um, uh, together with WASH data to inform uh, targeting of the, the, the interventions. Uh, but so other countries have used it, have used the uh, standardized um, indicators and monitoring frameworks. Uh, in their programs. Um, there's now examples of uh, NTD resource, uh, uh, NTD programs resourcing WASH and NTD collaboration. And some countries like Ethiopia have actually um, established some, um, established some, some mechanisms uh, and processes for joint planning and reporting. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, uh, so when we look ahead, um, so at the end of this year, WHO will be releasing a new roadmap um, that, uh, that sets targets for control, elimination, and eradication for uh, 20 uh, NTDs uh, by 2030. Um, the difference with the previous uh, roadmap is that, that um, this new uh, document really uh, places some emphasis on um, or, or on looking on, on, on a holistic uh, approach to NTD controls. So they include a lot of cross-cutting targets. Uh, WASH is one of them. So WASH is a lot more visible in the new roadmap. Um, just to note that the types of intervention like WASH, um, they, they, they have to be adapted and uh, over the course of the, the disease program, um, because obviously the disease transmission pattern change as we move uh, closer uh, towards disease elimination. Next slide, please. So in terms of next steps, um, so we're in the process of revising the Washington NTD strategy and we'll be uh, sharing it for consultation. So you're all invited to provide, so will, you will be all invited to provide feedback. Um, we will continue providing uh, support uh, to uh, country implementation and uh, there's a few uh, training um, um, uh, being planned for uh, this year and next year. Um, obviously, importantly, we want to document the lessons learned so far um, from programs, but also research projects. Um, and finally, in collaboration with the NNN, we're in the process of uh, conducting a research prioritization exercise. Um, so um, so we, 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 we would really invite you to, to give some input into it. So I've included the link. So please check out the survey uh, and share it with colleagues and, uh, and, uh, and, and, other, um, and other people who you think could, uh, could contribute, would be interested in contributing. 
So with that slide, I will stop and uh, I will hand over to Matt Freeman from Emory University to give an overview of the evidence uh, and the existing gaps. So thank you and uh, Matt, over to you. Thank you so much, Sophie and, and others. Uh, greetings from uh, beautiful Atlanta where uh, mo most people in the city are without power and I'm at a friend's house. So. Um, we're gonna. I'm gonna go over some uh, uh, some background around the evidence uh, for wash uh, NTDs and thinking mostly about how do we how do we contextualize this to know what the gaps are going to be and how we can bring evidence uh, to at scale interventions. Uh, next, so I'll try to answer these uh, four questions: uh, Which NTDs are most impacted by wash? What is the biological plausibility for the impact of wash on NTDs? What is the empirical evidence to support WASH? So what do we know from our field work? Um, and then fourth, uh, get us started thinking about what the key gaps are. So to reach impact at scale, what, what do we need to know? What do we know and what do we need to know? Why don't you just go through this slide? Uh, yeah, there we go. One more, there we go. So, um, oh, go back. Yeah, perfect. So first we want to think about plausibility. So do, should it work? Is there a biological plausibility um, that, that WASH uh, would impact uh, NTDs? Then efficacy, could it work if in the right conditions in the field um, were, were in place? Next would be effectiveness. Does it work? Can we actually, do we have programs and implement interventions in place um, that actually impact uh, that, that, that impact NTDs on the ground. And then if we ha have all three of those, then we can think about how do we institutionalize this into policy? And how do we think about context specific programs? Meaning if we know something works in Kenya, can we um, add, adapt it to Ethiopia? So that's about how we scale. And then what's interesting about the NTDs is of course, as we move from control to elimination, um, there are different interventions that may be needed, different coverage levels for WASH. Um, and so we may think, well, uh, WASH is really Im important during the control phase of a, of a certain entity, but, but during the elimination phase, we, we rely much more on the MDA or, or some, something else. So um, that's, that's kind of how we're gonna frame this quick uh, overview. Uh, next. So as Yael pointed out, you know, all of the NTDs are uh, WASH related, but there are several that have, um, are, are, have, have greater impact. And the ones in green are really around uh, acquisition through the um, through the environmental reservoirs uh, are wash related, and those in orange are ones that are more related to um, the 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 care and treatment. So, for example, care of uh, LF patients, you you need water um, for for that. Next. So this is a WASH conference, right? UNC is a WASH conference and we think mostly about water sanitation and hygiene. And for water, we're thinking oftentimes about drinking water. Um, for sanitation, we're thinking about uh, you know, toilets and the use of, of, of toilet or latrine facilities. And we're, we're oftentimes ta talking about hand washing with soap, though there have been in recent years more discussion around moving beyond just hand washing with soap as the primary hygiene component. We may be thinking about you know, removing ingestion of fecal um, fecal pathogens in the environment for young children, for example. Um, why don't you click through, uh, Yael? So one more. Oh, no, go back. Uh, looks like some of the graphics are missing. So for, of, of course, when we're thinking about these wash um, related uh, things, we're thinking about clean water and water improved water supply. For sanitation, we're thinking about use of everyone in the family, including uh, child disposal of feces. And then on the hand washing side, um, we're thinking also about bathing and what's not here is shoe wearing and face washing, which are wash behaviors not typically mainstreamed um, in wash programming, but are really important for several of these uh, NTDs. Next. So this, uh, this table um, shows uh, evidence from the uh, WHO led global burn disease from 2019. And what I wanna draw your attention to is on the left side, the diseases schistosomiasis, STH and trachoma, and the second column, population attributable fraction. And so through this work, we estimate that 48% of schistosomiasis could be prevented with improved wash and 100% of STH and trachoma could be prevented with improved wash. While we don't have the tools yet to actually implement wash that would drive 
100% uh, elimination of STH and trachoma, but the biological plausibility is sound. And so you can see on the right kind of deaths and dallies that would have been um, uh, re reduced had we had full coverage of WASH. Next. So there's a lot, there are a number of, um, of systematic reviews and meta-analyses um, from several years ago that reviewed some of this evidence. And a lot of these reviews um, are, uh, have ob used observational studies and a lot of recent high quality studies are not included. Next. So here are two reviews. Um, again, we're missing some graphics on the left-hand side. Sorry for that. Um, but what you can see is at the top, these are, uh, these are measures of re percent reduction in prevalence associated with improved wash. So um, at the top, treated water use was associated with 50%, 54% lower STH. Wearing shoes, 70% lower STH, predominantly hookworm. Soap availability, 47% lower STH. Hand washing after defecation, 53%, and sanitation access, 34%. And then the lower uh, figure shows associations between wash and trachoma. So bathing, clean towel, soap use, clean face, 60% um, associated with 60% lower uh, trachoma. And there are some issues with clean face as a measure. Um, and then sanitation access, 33% uh, lower. So there is good observational data. Uh, there's lots of observational studies, but not a lot of rigorous field trials. Next. Oh, here come the graphics, thank you. Um, click through maybe, one, two, three, four. Oh, back one. Um, okay, so we did a review of the impact of sanitation on the NTDs um, for, the, for the WHO as part of the development of the sanitation guidelines. And on the left side, you can see the comparisons for uh, sanitation with STH, trachoma, and schistosomiasis. And you see really uh, you know, lower, lower than one. So uh, uh, asterisk uh, 0.73 odds ratio associated with sanitation and significant. And most of these values down the, down the, down the column are with STH, trachoma, and schisto are significant, but these are using overall sanitation comparisons. These do not use um, kind of gold standard uh, trials. On the right-hand side, um, you can see we have many fewer studies associated with trial data. So intervention versus control. And if you look at these odds ratios, um, most of the confidence intervals overlap one, meaning we don't see a statistically significant difference. Um, and so, and, and the point estimates are, are closer in general, except for um, one in trachoma to the null, the null value. And so we need much more evidence of the effectiveness. Can we do it in the field um, and, and see these reductions that we anticipate uh, biologically? Next. So this is uh, some data from uh, a new uh, Cochrane systematic review, hot off the presses, we're still working on it, but I wanted to share it. And what it, what it is, is it shows only trials um, using a lot of the new high quality studies that have come out in the past several years. Um, and you can see at the bottom um, that we find a point estimate of 0.86 um, for the impact of wash on STH prevalence. So that means we see a statistically significant reduction of 14% uh, in the odds of STH uh, for these uh, rigorous field trials. So our evidence is getting better um, and we're getting now more statistically significant impact of the impact of, of WASH on STH. Yeah, there you go. So getting back to the gap. So again, does it work? Or should it work? We think yes. Does it work? We think yes. Um, could it work? Yes. Uh, sorry, go back one. Um, and then does it work? Well, we're not still not convinced of that and, and we don't quite know how to move these things to scale. Next. So this is the um, this is a, uh, a figure from the um, uh, from the WHO, basically showing you know sanitation is complicated. Why don't you click once? There we go. Um, so the implementation component is really complicated, and also this fecal load in the environment component is very complicated as it relates to NTDs, because even if you control if you give mass drug administration to all uh, community members with um, STH, for example, these eggs can still live in the environment for up to two years. So how do you actually measure uh, uh, the 
fecal load uh, or the, the load of the, of the eggs in the environment and, and mitigate uh, that risk uh, over enough time to, to control and eliminate the, um, uh, the disease in the population. Next. So we did a review of trachoma and uh, water and sanitation and looked at what, whether there was a coverage effect around um, water and sanitation, meaning as you move up, so on the, right, on the y-axis is the prevalence ratio, one being no effect, and on the bottom is uh, coverage levels in the community, 0 to 25, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, and 75 to 100, with the diamonds being indirect effect, um, and the, 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 the uh, circles being the direct effect. And when you look at water, we see basically no, no effect. As you move up and increase coverage for water, there's no um, association with uh, re reduced trachoma. Next. But for sanitation, we actually do see this trend that as you move up in sanitation coverage, the impacts go, um, uh, get much larger. And in fact, we see some kind of thresholds uh, around the 75% mark. And these, what the indirect, what the direct effect is telling you is if I have a toilet in my home, what's the impact on me and my kids? The indirect effect is if I live in a community with a lot of sanitation, what's the effect on me? And what you can see here is the indirect effect, meaning the coverage in the community is much more important for reducing your uh, risk than, um, than having a toilet for on, on your own. So me having a toilet helps a little, but all my neighbors having a toilet helps a lot. Next. And so how do we move this, who, how do we move this sector forward? Well, one issue is this, uh, this review was looking at interventions to improve sanitation coverage. And what you can see here at the bottom is looking across all of these uh, studies, the average change in sanitation coverage was only 13%. So we need to get much better at delivering sanitation to achieve higher coverage if we're actually going to have um, appreciable benefit to you know, diarrheal disease, but also the NTDs. Next. And this, um, this fairly complicated figure is actually from a review looking at the gray literature around trachoma. And the, the blue bars show whether uh, we looked at a number of different um, uh, documents that, uh, and we tried to assess whether people used what behavioral theories and approaches um, the different implementers used. And what the take home message for this is few interventions use behavioral theory. That looking across all of these interventions, there was not enough reliance on behavioral theory. There was a lot of focus on knowledge-based transmission, um, but not a lot on um, understanding the key drivers of change, meaning we don't necessarily need to know, or the community members don't need to know necessarily know that trachoma, um, uh, why they should wash their faces for trachoma, they should, we should be using their own, inter the drivers in that community, meaning they think clean face is beautiful, for example. All right, next. So last slide here, just to sum up, um, we know, I think we, we, we should feel pretty, pretty confident that the plausibility and efficacy are there for WASH on NTDs, but effectiveness and context specific programming is really a gap. And we really need to understand more the dominant transmission pathways and the thresholds for WASH on, on the NTDs, improve our environmental measurement, integrate behavioral theory into our intervention design, we need to understand how to really mainstream some of these important behaviors into wash programming, like face washing, shoe wearing, which can have a huge impact on hookworm. Um, and then we all want to ensure fidelity and adherence to the interventions to make sure that we're achieving um, what we expect. We do what we say we're going to do and we achieve what we expect to achieve in wash programming. So I think that's it for me. Thank you so much. Um, if you want to know more or contact me, there are um, links, links below. Great, thank you very much, Matt. Um, as Yale mentioned at the beginning, we're now gonna ask you to head over to Mural. If you're just joining us, uh, the link to join Mural is in the passable chat. So what we'd like to do now is turn it over to you for your insights and input. And Matt has given us some initial gaps uh, within the evidence and we'd like to hear from you. Do you have any additional examples of evidence gaps? And what do you think are, or what have you seen to be some of the methodological challenges in conducting research on WASH and NTDs? 
So you'll see here on the screen now, what we're doing is just the top part of this um, mural or whiteboard. And if you are a mural pro, welcome. If you haven't used mural before today, uh, this is your lucky day. It's colorful, simple, interactive, uh, fun, hopefully. So hopefully everyone has now managed to sign in uh, to mural. So please take a few minutes. Um, what you can do is you can either drag one of the sticky boxes over into the box and type uh, either the gap or the methodological challenge, or you can double click right in the box as Yael mentioned at the beginning. So we'll just ask people to start to put yours in and we will group them on the back end um, as this is happening. So great to see already some movement. Looks like we've got about 22 people on the mural, all with your associated animals. <laughs> so don't worry if you've seen that there's also something at the bottom of the mural, we'll come to that in the second half of the session. Okay, I'm seeing a few coming into the gaps here, such as sustaining behavior change. Feel free to continue to add, even if you've seen it up already, if it's something you want to emphasize, it'd be great to hear your input. Um, if you've got some country specific examples, please do add those as well. What, you know, for example, what research or evidence might help you work towards the targets of the new uh, NTD roadmap? Um, Uh, if in your national action plans and uh, entity master plans, uh, when you think about them, is there evidence that could help you um, know what actions or areas of focus are needed? Great, we're also seeing some challenges coming out here. Monitoring wash outcomes. Yeah, great measurement of pathogens in the environment. Great to see so much action here, great. Give it a few more minutes. We're trying to, we'll also try and group these together as we're seeing them come in. As you can see, we've got some very um, amazing busy people in the background doing that as we go. Okay, it looks like behavior change, behavioral um, based interventions is something we need to understand more as also Matt was mentioning around that gap and in the how we do it, how it looks on the ground. Um, having some better implementation models, again, to show what is uh, possible, what is successful on the ground. Another gap here highlighted around zoonotic disease transmission. I think we're seeing some more attention to that um, in recent years, which is good. If you, for some reason, aren't able to get the mural to work for you, feel free to also put your um, input into the passable chat box and we can transfer it over. So if you've seen any gaps um, within your work, uh, evidence gaps, or within your country context, please feel free to add those as well. not quite the same as being in the same room together, but hopefully everyone's getting that uh, sticky note activity feel as, as you're participating here. If you're finding it a bit hard to see, as Yale mentioned at the beginning, you can use your mouse roll in just to see what others are putting in.
Okay, so some of the methodological um, challenges, I think there's some, some really important ones here around um, how to tease out exposures from homes versus schools or other community settings. Um, some of the ethics that exist in working in post-conflict countries and countries um, where we know NTDs uh, to be an, uh, an issue a gap or maybe also a challenge around having process evaluations to really understand, of course, is it, why is it that um, that particular project or intervention uh, failed or didn't succeed or didn't go as planned. And then some much more sort of technical um, challenges as well around measurement of, of, the, of the actual pathogens in the environment. So I still see quite a bit of activity. We're, we're sort of coming close to the end. So maybe what we'll do is let people continue to write in, the, in their uh, sticky notes um, and we'll continue to kind of group them together and come back to this mural later on in the session. Uh, if that sounds okay to, to everybody else. Um, so maybe at this point, I will pass over I'd like to introduce uh, Katie Greenland uh, will, will be presenting on uh, the research Stronger Safe and Hygiene Interventions for Trachoma Control. Uh, she is with us, but with some internet connection issues. So we'll first play a recording. But if you have questions for, for uh, Katie or actually any of the speakers, feel free to put those in the Pathable chat box as well. So over to you, uh, Gail. Good afternoon, my name is Katie Greenland and I'd like to tell you about some of the evidence gaps on hygiene interventions for trachoma control that we're trying to address through the Stronger Safe trial. A quick recap for those of you less familiar with trachoma. Trachoma is an eye infection caused by chlamydia trachomatis or CT bacteria and it's the most common cause of infectious blindness globally. Active trachoma is usually seen in young children who get a mild eye infection but repeated infections over time lead to chronic inflammation, scarring and blinding complications. Trachoma control since the 1990s has been through the WHO endorsed SAFE strategy, which is S for surgery to avert eyelashes and prevent complications, A for antibiotics to treat infection, F for facial cleanliness, and E for environmental improvements, such as access to water and basic sanitation. In reality, most programs focus on the well-defined medical SNA elements of SAFE, but FNEA outcomes and the interventions required to achieve these outcomes are less well-defined. We have two key gaps in our understanding of these FNE components of SAFE. Firstly, we don't, don't know which route is most important for transmission from eye to eye, which makes it difficult to know which interventions to develop. And secondly, even when we have developed interventions, to try to improve f &E outcomes, we don't know how good these interventions are. Most of evidence comes from observational studies and there's also great variation in the definitions and measurement of WASH improvements. And this makes it harder to compare outcomes across studies, which in turn makes it hard to make decisions about the most effective ways to both change and measure behavior. Stronger Safe is a five-year research project designed to attempt to address these and other gaps in the evidence base for the SAFE strategy. In the first phase, we sought to improve our understanding of CT transmission. In the second phase, we developed FNE interventions to interrupt these transmission routes. And now we're about to start phase three, which is a cluster randomized trial to test the FNE intervention alongside intensified mass drug administration with azithromycin. Our study site is in rural Oromia near Shashamane, about 200 kilometers south of Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. This slide shows how CT bacteria is thought to spread from one eye to another. It leaves the eye inocular and nasal secretions and is transferred to another person's eye via eye-seeking muscus orbans flies, on fomites such as clothing and bedding, on hands after touching an eye, face or fomite, 
and directly from eye to eye through close contact. As you can see here, we can develop a number of different f and &E interventions to try to interrupt transmission. And with this in mind, I'd now like to tell you briefly about our phase one work and how we decided which of these transmission routes we wanted to target with our f and &E interventions. This table shows the results of two of our phase one studies to improve our understanding of transmission. And in the top row, I've summarized the results from the swabbing study. We swabbed a number of environmental surfaces and caught flies as they came off children's faces in 247 households. And we found CT bacteria on faces, hands, the collars and cuffs of clothing, as well as on 25% of the flies we caught from children's faces. The column headings show the interventions that might be important for interrupting these transmission routes. I don't have time to talk about the study more here, but if you're interested, you can read about it in the paper, uh, the reference here at the bottom of the slide. The second row summarizes my thoughts on the feasibility of intervening to interrupt these particular transmission routes based on findings from the formative research we did in phase one. Um, we believe it's possible to improve both the frequency and quality of face and hand washing in this context, but it would be more challenging to try to improve laundry of bedding and clothing to levels that might be expected to interrupt transmission. And it might be similarly challenging to try to remove human feces from the environment, again, to an extent that might reduce fly breeding sites. And that's given the low levels of sanitation coverage and, and current open defecation norms, as well as the limited budget we have available for intervention. However, the entomologists on this trial believe it's possible to try to repel and reduce fly populations through fly control interventions. So um, in our trial, we'll be testing a face and hand washing intervention and um, trying to improve both the frequency and quality of face washing, um, as well as fly control interventions, specifically fly traps and fly repellent scarves and caps, which children will be asked to wear. So we hope that this cluster randomized control trial that we're about to start will provide us with better evidence about whether these specific f and &E interventions are effective in our study setting. And just before I end, I'd like to remind us all that there are still things that we haven't fully cracked. And um, for one thing, we just don't know which precise behaviors we should attempt to change such as how often faces need to be washed to interrupt transmission and whether soap is necessary. We've done some pilot work to look at this and we are planning a larger study. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, it is difficult to compare across studies as everyone measures something different, as you can see in some of the examples in these tables. So I just want us to not forget the importance of measurement when we think about generating evidence on the effectiveness of our f and &E interventions. So thank you for listening, and I'd like to acknowledge our many collaborators at London School and elsewhere, and of course the Wellcome Trust who funded the trial. So thank you very much. Great, thank you very much to Katie, and I think we're now handing over to Jed Snyder from Emory. Over to you, Jed. Hi everyone, I'm Jed Snyder from Emory. Uh, for the next five minutes, I'd like to introduce our project called Re-Envisioning the F in SAFE. This is an operational research project uh, for enhanced evaluation. I'll provide a quick overview of efforts at Emory University on piloting tools to evaluate behavior change and introduce a lar larger collaborative study uh, that we are conducting. Next slide. So as a quick background, uh, as we've highlighted throughout this session, um, Personal hygiene interventions such as face cleaning and hand washing are often incorporated within WASH and NTD community-based programs. A key example of this is the SAFE strategy. As we heard from Katie, facial cleanliness or F has been hypothesized to interrupt transmission and protect against trachoma. And so here we have a very simplified uh, logic model showing the progression of personal hygiene interventions leading to the uptake of improved personal hygiene practices, clean faces and clean hands, and then the eventual downstream reduction in the risk and intervention of uh, trachoma. Next slide. So how do we measure uh, the, these types of behavior interventions um, and, and evaluate their impacts? 
Um, for interventions themselves, we have process indicators such as fidelity and delivery that are defined by the program. Uh, as Katie mentioned, for cleanliness, we have outcome metrics for faces and hands uh, that are free of dirt and faces that are free of ocular nasal discharge. However, these conventional metrics or metrics that measure just the presence or absence may be limited in their ability to monitor the uptake of uh, face cleaning and hand washing practices. Next slide. And so to better enable assessments of personal hygiene practices and enhance evaluations, we sought to create a metric that could um, generate quantitative data on facial and hand cleanliness. And so we developed QFAT, which stands for Quantitative Personal Hygiene Assessment Tool. Um, in this method, we use gauze pads that are pre-moistened with sterile saline solution as shown here in this photograph. Um, and then we then trace the skin along the participant's hands or eyes uh, separately uh, using standardized procedures, which you can see here on the diagrams on the right. Next slide. And so this photograph indicates an example of what a gauze pad looks like after performing this procedure. And so to collect quantitative data, we then score the wipe by comparing the darkest area of the gauze pad to the QFAT color scale. Uh, this color scale is an 11 point scale where 10 represents a clean gauze pad progressing to zero, zero indicating a dirtier wipe. And so for this example here, we would see that our wipe would be scored as a three. Next slide. And so we tested this new measurement method uh, in Amhara, Ethiopia during our underlie trial. I'll keep the details here very short, but would like to direct you to this manuscript uh, if you'd like to learn more about the study and, and the trial itself. Um, overall, we found that QFAT produced highly reliable estimates of facial cleanliness and hand cleanliness across different types of radar comparisons. That is different types of radars, such as blinded radars, uh, non-blinded radars, and even computer radars had high levels of agreement of the scores for different WEMPs. Um, and so while this suggests that QFAT provides more nuanced assessments than the conventional presence or absence metrics, uh, we did identify further operational research needs in order to provide program recommendations. Next slide. And so specifically, these operational research objectives included a replication of this reliability study, but now looking at um, comparing to current metrics, uh, the current qualitative metrics, and looking at settings outside of the underlying trial. Uh, we, was, we wanted also to look at the validity, validity assessments. And so this is looking at do the measurements truly measure what we were intending them to measure. So thinking back to our logic model on cleaning practices and, and trachoma outcomes. And lastly, utility assessments, which brings all of these details together uh, to provide evidence-based recommendations for F and SAFE programming. Next slide. And so with these operational research objectives in mind, Emory University submitted a proposal to the NTD Support Center to move these studies forward. Uh, this inspired a collaboration of different F and SAFE partners um, to identify different countries and, and leverage resources. As a result, this study is taking place in four different study sites, uh, Pakistan, two sites in Ethiopia, and Tanzania. And so if the pandemic conditions allow, we are hoping to start data collection in 2021 with wrapping up uh, data analysis and reporting early next year. So we can hopefully share our findings to you all at this time uh, next year. Next slide. And so with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. If you have any questions, definitely feel free to reach out or visit our website. Um, and now I'd like to hand it over to Marianne who's going to talk about uh, work at the Carter Center on guinea worm eradication. Thank you, Jed. My name is Mary Ann Dilley. I'm an epidemiologist with the Guinea Worm Eradication Program at the Carter Center. Um, for those of you today, I'm going to be talking about Guinea Worm Eradication Program. Uh, next slide, please. 
uh, for those of you who may not be as aware of, of kidney worm disease, it is caused by a parasite, uh, the nematode roundworm parasite, Dracunculus metadensis. It is a particularly debilitating disease and peak transmission season in many areas coincides with cultivation season. which can actually push vulnerable households um, into more precarious situations given they're not able to go into this due to the debilitating uh, nature of the disease. Guinea worm was slated for eradication by the World Health Assembly in 1991 through resolu resolution 44.5, and it will be the first parasitic disease to be eradicated. This will be a particularly exciting, no chemotherapeutic intervention currently available to treat or prevent. The eradication program has used only behavioral interventions and the treatment of water with a bait larvicide to achieve its success. 1986, back, one slide back, please. In 1986, when the Carter Center and country ministries of health assumed the lead of global and national guinea worm eradication programs, there were approximately 3.5 million cases of guinea worm disease with one, 120 million people at risk annually in 20 countries. In 2019, there were a total of 54 cases of guinea worm disease in four countries. To date, the Guinea Worm Eradication Program has averted at least 80 million cases of this devastating disease amongst the world's poorest and most neglected populations. This progress reflects a 99.9% .9 reduction in cases annually through the use of traditional program interventions, which I'll touch on in a moment. Next slide, please. As with most public health prob uh, problems, eradication is not straightforward, and I probably wouldn't be here today had um, what I'm about to touch on next not occurred. Uh, we likely would have eradicated guinea worm by now. But one significant challenge to eradication has been the emergence of guinea worm infections amongst animals. So during 2010 and 2011, cases of guinea worm were detected um, in Chad, and these human cases of guinea worm disease appeared incidental in nature with no links uh, to common sources of infection. And the following year in 2012, guinea worm infections were detected amongst domesticated dogs. And a year later, infections were detected amongst domesticated cats. So the lack of epidemiological links between human cases of guinea worm disease and the high ratio of animal infections to human cases supported the hypothesis that the consumption of a, a contaminated aquatic peritonic or transport host was driving guinea worm transmission in Chad. And the leading theory is that aquatic animals consume copepod copa worm larvae, um, so consumption of the aquatic peritonic indoor animal hosts. So when fish or other aquatic animals are prepared for consumption, their entrails are often removed and they're either fed directly to animals, uh, domesticated dogs or cats, or they're indiscriminately disposed of in an open environment where dogs and cats can consume them due to poor sanitation and hygiene conditions. With the identification of these novel hosts, the global and national guinea worm eradication programs in affected countries consider new program interventions to, to interrupt these novel transmission pathways. Um, and these new scientific and implementation were needed to be addressed. Now,
Oh, okay. It looks like we we having some technical issues with this presentation. Uh, Marianne, maybe you um, want to next turn slide. your camera, please, and see if that works better that way. Turn my camera off. Okay, fantastic. So before discussing the research that is being conducted to explore those knowledge gaps, I'd like to provide a bit of an overview of available It looks, Marianne, uh, I'm sorry, it looks like we've lost you completely. Um, it appears it appears that we're having some technical difficulties um, and just due to time um, my name is mariana stevens i'm with the children without worms program and um, do know that the presentation will be available marianne i apologize for the technical difficulties um, but with that said, I wanted to know at this time um, if we could divert back to the mural that we started um, before these presentations. So thank you, Katie, Jed, and Marianne. And um, what we wanted to do with the group, um, as you all know, we focused um, in the beginning of the mural looking at gaps and methodological challenges. I'd like everyone to scroll down to um, the bottom section where you can already see people are starting to populate research examples. And so if we could take five minutes quickly, and again, look over to the sticky notes and bring them over and type in some now research examples. Um, you can base them on the presentations we just heard or some of the work that you're doing right now. So if everybody could go back to our beautiful mural board and, um, Please feel free to take just a few seconds to review the gaps and the um, methodological um, challenges. But then as you look at the bottom of the mural board, you can scroll down and you can look at the research examples and start populating some research examples in that section. Um, I've got my colleague Yale who is helping um, organize the board. So thank you so much, Yale. And I see a lot of movement already as we're populating the research examples. Um, again, just kind of go over to uh, the left side of your screen and take those sticky notes and move it over to the research examples and you can begin typing your research examples. So I'll give a few minutes as we are looking at people taking their sticky notes going across. Um, so we'll continue that for another um, three to four minutes. Mariana, if I may just um, add one instruction. Um, if you have any research ideas rather than um, a specific research project that's happening, you can add those and make them blue. So you can do that by clicking on the note and changing the color. Excellent, so. thank you, Yale. If you are putting in a pink uh, post-it note, please do add uh, where this research is happening 
Otherwise, I think we'll assume it's an idea rather than an actual project. Great, so I see we're getting both blue and pink ideas um, and appreciate people putting in where the research is happening. Thank you so much. Um, Looks like we've got some implementation and operational research in the collaboration models in different contexts. That's a great one. Common ME framework with joint indicators. Um, okay, I know that we're getting at close to our time. Um, please feel free to continue this. And I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Helen, um, to do some of our closing to make sure we have um, a closing discussion before we end our session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariana. Uh, so thank you everyone for, for being with us for this. So, I have the, the pleasure of, of wrapping us up in the last um, five minutes or so that we have together today. So first of all, I'd like to say thank you both to the UNC team who are doing a huge amount to support behind the scenes all through this week. Um, and also to our fantastic presenters and moderators and facilitators, as well as all of you that have contributed to the discussion um, on Poll Ev and also on the murals today. Um, and thank you for making it such a, an inspiring session. Um, I'm not necessarily going to try to summarize everything today, but really just take stock of what we've what we've heard and share some reflections. So as we sort of said when we kicked off, we're awaiting the launch of the new neglected tropical disease roadmap. And that really highlights that new document highlights a critical role for WASH in addressing NTDs. And that's really underpinned by new cross-cutting indicators on WASH. Um, and when, when Sophie was presenting, it really struck me just how much we've achieved in the five years since the first global strategy on WASH and NTDs was launched. And even, since, and even before that, the eight years since the first NTDs roadmap was launched. You know, we've seen significant um, progress, as we've heard today, around building the evidence base, particularly around targeting different types of evidence. We've also seen the Washington NTD toolkit, um, which is a very evidence-based toolkit being used in over um, 15 countries. And we've also seen national strategies and action, as we heard from Sultani right at the beginning. And I think the prominence of WASH in the new roadmap really reflects that recognition that WASH and NTDs working together really makes sense. And that's very much about us being able to effectively target WASH services where, they're most, most, where, are, where they are most needed, as well as securing progress on NTDs through these really contextual targeted interventions. Um, and I was, I was really struck by the impact that Sultani talked about, about the, um, the impact for, of WASH for disease prevention in Kenya, um, particularly the, the phrase trachoma is incompatible with, the, with clean faces. I think that's a phrase we should all be using as much as we can. Um, and I think in terms of, you know, we've really, we really need to focus on, you know, how NTDs is linked to this sort of poor access to WASH. And this can really exacerbate the cycles of poverty um, and NTDs. And so where, where we're getting to today with some of our discussions is really about being able to target NTD hotspots to make sure that we're really progressing on two tracks towards universal access to WASH and universal health coverage in line with the new roadmap. And so it's great to see all that action on the mural boards, both the ideas and the current e examples. Um, and I think it's from the, uh, from the poll, Ev, it's, it's clear to lots of us on the, on the call, and I hopefully now everybody on this meeting, that although there might be some challenges around the quality of of evidence and studies, and we still need to really look at how we target our, our research and our evidence. 
it's absolutely a, a sort of no brainer. It's not, there's no doubt that WASH plays a really key role in the transmission of NTDs that we discussed today, as well as in treatment and care. And it's absolutely fundamental to achieving the new targets for the roadmap. So I think a couple of things that stuck out to me was being really clear on how we're reducing those risks around transmission and exposure and being really specific on what we're doing around targeted behavioral interventions around water sanitation and hygiene and building the evidence on how best we target those interventions to the challenges and um, particularly as uh, multiple presenters highlighted around behavioral change approaches and context specific programming. And I think when we, when we think about behaviors, often we're thinking about the, where, where we may be working. I think as well, now that we've all heard that summary of the evidence today, it's also on us to make sure that we're, we're supporting the best possible evidence, evidence-based decision-making, but also potentially for us to change our behaviors if some of the things we've heard today are new to us. And if we want to see that accelerated change, we need to change our context and behaviors. So really thinking about who might contend, you know, that there are people out there who contend that WASH doesn't work, that it might be too difficult or too expensive as we heard. We really need to push them to recognize WASH as a first line of defense and ensure it isn't an afterthought as was highlighted earlier. But also highlighting that the NTD sector has a really critical role to play in WASH resource allocation and bringing budgets and quality, quality and amounts of funding together. And I thought Matt's point around the population attributable fraction around the percentage, you know, over 40% for Schisto and 100% for STH and trachoma was a really critical point. So in conclusion, I think we're seeing a significant amount of collaboration at country level as some of the examples highlighted today. And we really have the evidence, the successes, the partnerships and the relationships to continue to build on and leverage from in order to accelerate this work and really make an impact. So my, my closing point is let's not let anything stand in our way as we're working together to deliver the ambition on this new roadmap and the upcoming strategy on Washington NTDs. Let's keep this conversation going. Please do take part in the survey that's in the Pathable chat box and please do share it with your colleagues. Um, and once again, a final thanks to all of the presenters and the moderators and everyone today who's joined to contribute and participate in the session. Thank you very much.